tonight in introducing our speaker, who I've had wonderful conversations with on the telephone. She's an extraordinarily responsive representative of her organization. Angela Moscow is director of the California Oaks Program that's now part of California Wildlife Foundation. It used to be called the California Oaks Foundation. Am I correct, Angela? Yes. Yeah, that's how I knew it originally. She has a really interesting background. And um, her degrees are in uh, environmental studies and philosophy from Oberlin, which I think is a wonderful combination. And uh, she received her master's from UC Davis in international agricultural development. So she's got a many, many uh, calmed background. And her, some of her earlier posts include working for Urban Sprouts, which delivers community nutrition and garden-based education in San Francisco, the Bay Institute, which promotes ecological health of San Francisco Bay and its watershed, the University of California Small Farm Center, UC Genetic Resources Conservation Program, Consumer Action, and Whiskey Town Environmental School. Anyway, she's got an interesting background and lots of information to share with us. This is in keeping with keeping the public informed about the importance of oaks, oak woodlands, and the ordinances that are coming up, or keep coming up. April 16th. April 16th is the next meeting. Wendy. Fingers crossed. Okay, yeah, Wendy Krupnak, um, Trish Tatarian, um, Wendy, Wendy Smith, and others have all been involved. Caitlin Cornwall, and uh, Natasha and others in helping push this thing through and nobody's giving up. And in fact, the Oaks Foundation, as I remember, wrote a letter in support of it. We've written quite a few. Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, it's all yours now. Okay. And I'm gonna... Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here on the first evening of spring to talk about California's primary old growth resource, our oaks. And I've got to share a lot of information. Um, oh, there we are. Um, so hopefully um, not too much information, um, mostly talking about oaks and biodiversity. And mostly talking about a report that we produce that for those in the room is over on the table and it's on oaks and threatened, endangered. Those two terms are often used as listed species or um, candidate species for protection. Um, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts, of how we put that together. And um, and then we'll spend just a couple slides on a report that is in production now, what we call the Oaks Underground, about oaks and mycorrhizal fungi. And we'll look at a few maps, including some historic maps. And then we'll talk a little bit about California's oak protections, which are few and far between. And then the work that we're doing to try to keep oaks standing. Um, and a lot of that is work in collaboration with the California Oaks Coalition. So um, as you heard, we used to be called California Oak Foundation. Most people still call us that. But about um, now, about 14 years ago, we became a program of California Wildlife Foundation. The executive officer was running both programs and she combined them for administrative ease. And the Wildlife Foundation is about maintaining in conserving and restoring habitat corridors um, and um, habitats to ensure the biodiversity of species over time. So our oaks are very important for um, California's diverse plant and animal communities. So um, the primary work of California Oak Program is keeping our oaks standing and um, and we work to perpetuate and conserve our oaks in collaboration with other organizations. And a lot of that collaborative work is through 
what's called the California Oaks Coalition. At the moment, there's 79 members of the coalition. One of the members is California Native Plant Society, and some of the individual chapters are also members, and there's also a restoration committee in um, San Diego County that's a member. And you all really are members already, but those that have signed up just get more information from our office. Um, and the coalition's mostly in California, but we have a professor from a um, university in Portugal. We also have the um, genetic, the, sorry, the um, Global Conservation Consortium for Oak, um, which is operating out of the Morton Arboretum in Illinois, and they work throughout the world um, on oak populations. Um, and actually, way over in the corner, there is a conservation gap analysis that they did um, that feeds into the work that um, Jose talked about, um, I think, in the last presentation um, for six imperiled oak species in Southern California that are a big focus of Oak Watch. And um, we also do work with decision makers, trying to persuade them to um, keep our oak standing. We write a lot of comment letters. Um, we make comments not only on development proposals, but also on policies associated with oak. So just a little bit about our organization, and then I'll dive into the the heart of the material. So there are really four pillars of our work. and. I'll talk today mostly about the fourth pillar, but um, everything we do really brings in all of these themes. So a bit about each of those. Oaks are very important culturally in California. Um, for millennia, our oaks were stewarded and um, fire was used in um, maintaining our oak woodlands and oak forested lands. Um, the the um, Acorn is very important culturally for many native populations. It's important um, for nutritional purposes, for medicinal purposes. Um, it's also very important for wildlife. So that stewardship was, was protecting our ecosystems. In the work we're doing on our Oaks Underground Report, we also have learned that a lot of that stewardship was also favoring certain fungi, certain mushrooms and um, truffles that um, were beneficial for various purposes. So um, this went on for many, many thousands of years and then the Europeans showed up. We know the story. Um, one historian, Scott Mensing, talks about 1848, so right before the gold rush as really the tipping point, he calls, that the beginning of the American period. Um, and that's really when the oak became the disfavored tree. Doesn't fit neatly into the mills. It's in the way in, um, in farmland. So um, that's when the oak problem started. One moment, I'm sorry. The Zoom is not, the slides aren't updating properly. Uh, let, me, let me try one thing real quick. Sorry about that, everybody. So glad that got, somebody who knows what he's doing is here. <laughs> and we got 26 people joining us online as well. So, okay. I believe we're all. And for those of you who are online, um, everything I'm going to talk, most everything I'm going to talk about lives on our website with one exception. I made a little handout for folks here tonight. So you'll see there's some footnotes and, um, the expectation is if they're of interest, just grab that little handout and that will have all that information. So if you wanna dig a little deeper into anything, we have that information. We also have a little sign up sheet for anybody who might want to um, be, who's with an organization that might want to join the Oaks Coalition. So another um, aspect of our Oaks that's important is that they sequester carbon. 
And a forester worked on a couple of reports for us. The first was back when we were the Oak Foundation and we did a two part report called Oaks 2040. And one of the parts was on carbon resources. And there he estimated that above ground and below ground our oak woodlands and oak forested lands are sequestering approximately 675 million metric tons of carbon. And he recently worked on another report and um, we have information on that in our most recent newsletter. It's our um, fall winter 2023 newsletter. And there he used different methodologies and he was just looking at above ground carbon and he was looking the data was such that he only could pull information on hardwoods. So it's not just oaks, but oaks are our dominant hardwoods in California. And there he came up with a figure of 903.6 million metric tons of above ground carbon. And um, for both of these reports, he included the tan oak. Tan oak is not a Quercus species. Um, it's However, a tree that is in the same family, it produces acorns, so it's important culturally and it's important for wildlife. So, um, but, and all of his analyses were the, ma the major oak species as well. So not all of the, all of California's oak species, but um, I believe it was eight other species and then the tan oak. And, um, our oaks are also very important for our waterways. They help to sh cool the waterways. It's estimated that two, greater than two thirds of our drinking water supply in California is um, either flowing through or stored in reservoirs in, in oak woodlands or oak forested lands. Oaks are important for facilitating the replenishment of groundwater they also help with erosion, they slow things down, they help the soil absorb the water. And our deepest dive was in a report that's also over on the table or for those online um, available from the newsletter link on our website. And it's a report that was focused on the San Joaquin Basin, um, looking at how oaks historically um, were in growing in the basin, how they're important for the wildlife, including imperiled wildlife, and how they um, could potentially be restored as lands are taken out of agricultural production. So um, that's our deepest dive. We've also in our report that's at the printer now um, looked at the mycorrhizal fungi and how they are impacting oak hydrology. And then um, another report over there, our spring summer 2023 issue talked about oaks and fishes. So um, we get into the oak water equation from time to time. And then lastly, and the reason I'm here tonight is that oaks are very important for our biodiversity in California. Um, and again, all this information that I'm sharing pretty quickly on these slides is available in our newsletters and um, the, the information about the footnotes again is in that little handout. So um, one of the questions for our tiny little organization is, well, how do you distill this down so that we can reach people with this message? And this graphic really inspired us to do the report on the listed species or candidate species and oaks. This is from a consortium of organizations working up in the Pacific Northwest and also into Canada. And they do a lot of public education work, a lot of restoration work and conservation work. And they really boiled it down to extirpated species, endangered species, um, other vulnerable species. And so that's what set us off on our journey. And um, again, um, what I'm sharing is, is, is a snapshot. It's from a moment in time. Our report was put out in the spring of 2021. So since then, there've been a couple changes, a few changes, I'll talk about a couple of them. Um, but all of this information is distilled in this report. 
and I violate all the rules of PowerPoint. I have tons of information in the slides, but um, hopefully this is a group that likes that kind of stuff. So we um, used a lot of information maintained by California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we couldn't have done our report without their help. Um, and there were three databases that um, were the basis of our report. And from them, there are 34 vertebrates, 134 plant species, and 26 invertebrate species that are included. Um, and on this slide, and again, also in the report, you see that it's not always the whole species that's protected. It's often just a population or it's a subspecies. So all of those terms are here. Um, and we'll start with our vertebrates. And this vertebrate here is a ringtail. And the ringtail is actually a California fully protected species. And this is all a little bit complicated, but that's just, it's a term that predates California's Endangered Species Act. And, and it confers the same protection. So it's only the vertebrates that have that status, only some of them. So um, if you pick up this report and flip through it or look at the subsequent slides, you'll see that some are called fully protected. So that's what that means. And um, to pull this list, we used a database called the California Wildlife Habitat Relationship System. And it's a fairly robust database that talks about the vertebrates and also the habitats that they, they utilize. And so because of that, we're able to say that these are dependent upon oak. They use the habitat for reproduction, for cover, or for feeding. And within this database, there are categories of habitat. They're not all of the complex alliances or associations that CNPS is so important of an organization and helping to organize, but um, they're broad categories. So for the broad categories that include oaks as a dominant species, those were the ones that were pulled. And here the Tano is a part of that system. So we look at um, both the Quercus and Tano dependent species. And here is the first slide. And again, I'm violating all the rules. There's tons of information up there, but if you're interested, um, download or pick up a copy of this report. And um, so, you know, why did we go to all this trouble? You know, I said, you know, one of the ideas is to kind of boil it down that E equals MC squared. We could say 34 vertebrate species are dependent upon oaks. But um, not only does the public not know this information, but even the conservation community doesn't know this information. For instance, there's a report that was issued in 2020 by the um, Central Valley Joint Venture with information about um, restoring or conserving bird populations. For 14 of the bird species that are named in this wildlife database as oak dependent, they don't have that information in their report. And these are preeminent scientists working on an important document in California. So this information lies buried in databases. So that's why I'm here today. Um, so here, this is the amphibians and birds. And then next we have the mammals and the reptiles. And one of the mammals was not in our report. It's the humble martin. And the humble martin was a um, is a, a subspecies that we didn't find literature on that linked it to the oaks until after we finished our report. So you are privy to that information. And I'm realizing um, for the prior slide, I should have mentioned that the great gray owl was not in the ha habitat wildlife relationship database, but we found literature that talked about the great gray owl in California using oak for their nests approximately 30% of the time. So they're included and we filled out the paperwork for Fish and Wildlife to include them in their database in the future. So then we go to the plants and the invertebrates. And, and here was a little more of an artful process to come up with the tables. And again, 
I claim no credit. It was folks at the Department of Fish and Wildlife who pulled all this together. And they used two different databases, the California Natural Diversity Database, which probably some of you are familiar with. And, and that's a pretty robust database and it has occurrence data. Doesn't track everything. For instance, I don't believe the um, mountain lion is tracked, but many imperiled species are tracked in that database. Another database that lives at Department of Fish and Wildlife is the Areas of Conservation Emphasis database. And in there is oak data, not on tan oaks, but on other oaks. And I believe that data is becoming higher quality because of lobbying by CNPS for state money to do fine scale vegetative mapping in California. So that's really important. So hopefully if somebody does this report again, probably won't be us, um, th there will be more robust data. But basically the two databases were used together at a threshold of 5% overlap or greater was used. And that threshold was informed by a study that was done by University of California in the mid nineties, looking at sensitive plants and oaks. And if um, we brought the number down that low, then all those sensitive plants would be captured. So, um, here we go. We have lots and lots of plants. Um, and here's a picture of the Bine Hill Manzanita taken at the Laguna de, de Santa Rosa. Um, and you all know more about these plants than I do. Um, that's why this yellow highlighting was applied. We made another mistake and that was we had an S at the end of the word and a French editor found that. So thought some of you might notice that. And um, one more slide, that's our 134 plant. I think it was 134. Um, and um, so just one story about the plants and the oaks, and this pertains to CNPS and the chapter in San Luis Obispo County. We've worked with them on a number of comment letters and different proposals down that way. We also worked with them on an oak ordinance. Fortunately, that ordinance has a big loophole. And so there's a terrible project that's sliding through that loophole. And according to the Native Plant Society, some of the habitat dates to the ice age. And it's it's a matrix of rare plants and oaks. And it's so rare that in the environmental documentation, the discussion is, well, the mitigation lands might have to take, might have to be in another county. There's one other county, Santa Barbara, that has a similar habitat matrix like that. So it's this association that's so important and um, so un unrecognized um, by so many of the decision makers. And um, next we're on to our invertebrates. And um, this reminds me that to tell you about a couple of examples of changes since 2021, when we put out this report, the um, Franklin's bumblebee, which is listed here as a candidate species, is now a candidate for state protection, is now um, under federal environmental species act protection, um, endangered species act protection. So um, their habit changes also, I was negligent in um, not mentioning that the California spotted owl is now a um, candidate for federal protection. And that's that's another oak, um, oak dependent species. Um, so um, I mentioned we're also looking underground um, and our little report on oaks and mycorrhizal fungi really follows our four main themes. And um, it'll be up on our website, on our newsletters page when it's out, hopefully um, early next month. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a subject I knew nothing about when I started in on it, and I still know very little. But um, California's oaks have been evolving for over 2 million years. 
And the fungi have also been evolving and co-evolving with the oaks. So um, they really, they're like a little superpower that our oaks have. Um, the slide, which kind of looks like modern art to me, is showing um, hyphae and rhizomorphs. And rhizomorphs are like little, um, they're, they're the hyphae all wound up, so little strands of hyphae. And, and they're kind of like galoshes that you put over your shoes. Um, they, they, they go over the roots and, and they go deep, deep, deep into the bedrock. They access water. They're very important for um, carbon sequestration. So, so there's this other element that's super um, interesting and um, a, a um, whole world that is really kind of booming right now. You've, if you go to a bookstore, there are all these books about um, fungi and mycorrhizae. And, um, and according to Michael Allen, a professor who helped us with our report, um, some of the old growth stands that he's examined have over 500 taxa of ectomicro mycorrhizal fungi. The ectomycorrhizal are the ones on, on the deep roots. Um, and, um, and so these, that relationship is, is very important for keeping our oaks going. And then it, it goes on and on and the complexities continue. Um, so the, um, mushrooms and truffles are, 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 are fruiting bodies for some of the fungi. And so for some of our imperiled owls, um, their prey eat those fungi. So, so the, the biodiversity story is, is a multi-pronged story. And this fellow here, he, he's with the um, San Diego Wildlife Alliance and he's been doing tree culture work as part of the project that um, inspired the Oak Watch. Um, focused on six imperiled species in Southern California. And so for some of the really tough um, species like like the Dumo Puercus dumosa, he's been doing tissue culture work. And so he he was out on an expedition. The first time he wanted to go out, there was flash flooding. So he couldn't, couldn't collect that day, but the next um, effort was on a beautiful day. And so I was really happy that he shared some of his pictures with us. Um, so um, just a little bit on the world of mapping. Over on the left, we have an estimate of California's oak woodlands. They're the lighter green and oak forested lands. And um, over on the right, it's, it's that same map, but overlaid on top of it is, and this is a mouthful, it's areas of unprotected biodiversity importance. So it's not just areas of, uh, of biodiversity importance, but they're areas that are unprotected. And that map is from a report that was issued in the spring of 2021 by NatureServe and collaborators. And they have all these great maps that are part of that report and they make them readily available. They thought what we were doing was great. So we did the overlay um, just to show how our oaks and our imperiled biodiversity are not 100% overlapping, but, but have a lot of overlap. And an interesting thing about that report is that we think of California as pretty much at the forefront of environmental protection, but we as a state are at, at the um, highest level of unprotected biodiversity in the country, 27.6%. 26, so we have work to do. And part of that is we have very important biodiversity in California. So um, to play around with this and to think, about the Wayback Machine and what maybe our oak landscapes looked like before and how they would overlap with um, that areas of biodiversity, unprotected biodiversity importance. I took, um, I made another slide that is um, looking at it in just Southern California. So take a look at that purple um, down in the Southern part of the state and the coastal area. And here is a map 
from um, a publication that came out in 1972. And it's that red is just Quercus agrifolia or the coast live oak. And so you see it was a lot more robust back then. Um, and the report um, was the distribution of forest trees in California. It's a great little thing that you can actually find on the web. And um, half of the data that fed into it, half of the mapping data was actually from ground crews that went out. And then um, other data filled out the rest of the, the state. So we're losing our oaks and Again, the, the, it, there's that overlap with our biodiversity. And then just one more map, and that's from this um, report that was looking at the San Joaquin Basin and groundwater and oaks. And this is of um, the, the greater San Joaquin Basin. So not just the San Joaquin River, but a little bit farther south. And that bright red there is um, Valley Oak Savanna. And um, it was estimated that there were over 100,000 hectares of Valley Oak Savanna in just the Cahuilla River Basin alone. So it was this really incredible landscape that is now um, very degraded. And so this little report was just our organization's attempt to say, well, when you think about um, retiring some farmlands and trying to get the groundwater balance back, think about oaks. Um, and so just a little bit about California's oak protections, which are unfortunately not very robust, but um, just a quick little primer on those. Um, there was legislation that brought oaks in unincorporated areas of counties under the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. Um, so if, if there's a project in an unincorporated area of a county, then um, in, in a threshold of significance is reached and that's always questionable um, because what we think is significant might not be what the county calls significant. But um, then oaks are subject to CEQA, which means basically that there needs to be some type of mitigation. So they're not necessarily, they're not, protected, but there, there's some making the environment whole. There are some um, counties with strong protections. Hopefully this county will become one of them. Um, there are cities that have oak protections, but even when there are protections, they have to be enforced. And so that's another area where things can fall apart. Um, there, there has been some good work on the issue of conifer encroachment um, with the suppression of fire. There's um, a lot of areas of the state where you can see the little oaks are being overtopped by the conifers. So a suite of measures was enacted um, to address that issue. And then there's a little chestnut that we trot out from time to time that only one state agency really um, embraces. It's not a law. It was a state concurrent resolution and it pertains to four oak species. And there's one state agency, Department of Transportation, that actually hews to this. But I think they actually have one of their species different than what is in the concurrent resolution, which is kind of interesting. But at least Department of um, Transportation is trying to either either protect oaks or mitigate for the impacts. Um, so we last fall in collaboration with the Global Conservation Consortium for Oak and the San Diego Wildlife Alliance, Alliance sent a letter to all these state agencies saying, what are you doing for, uh, to comply with this, this um, concurrent resolution? And we, we, we basically got confirmation that the letter had been received. <laughs> So um, that was not very heartening, but um, so we we turned to our partners out there, the California Oaks Coalition, to try to uh, broaden our impact. And so um, we just we generate a lot of information 
see all the information here or if you're online on our website. Um, and we try to help in any way that we can with members of the coalition, any, anybody who asks us for help. Um, and we try to tell good stories about work to support Oaks, um, provide information about how to engage the public, how to move decision makers, um, and just a few stories um, to, to kind of wrap up the content here. Um, in our most recent newsletter, we talk about a um, property in Napa County, the Walt Ranch. It was very controversial. Some of you probably heard about it. And in the end, it was very surprising. The developers decided to work with the county to protect the property. And that was because one of the members of the Oaks Coalition, in particular, the, the Center for Biological Diversity, was suing. So they 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 kind of wore them down. And these billionaires from Texas, you know, who we were gonna do all this terrible stuff, um, decided, well, you know, we're we're done. We'll 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 get some brownie points for making um this land available for conservation. And so so that was great great outcome. Um, but, you know, it took time and treasure of an organization to, um, to get that outcome. Um, we also in that most recent newsletter talked about the um, Oak Watch platform being used by a member of the Oaks Coalition down in San Diego, um, the Earth Discovery Institute, and, and they are doing trainings uh, on a property with some imperiled oaks um, to try to, again, get the public engaged um, in understanding the importance of oaks and also potentially helping to map oaks, especially some of these rarer oak species. Um, and then in our fall winter 22 issue of oaks, um, we, we talked uh, in some detail about the um, effort in Southern California focused on the six imperiled oak species um, that that Jose probably spoke about. Um, and um, that that tw fall winter 22 issue, which we didn't print enough copies of, so I only have one copy of, also talks about um, how an oak woodland bird conservation plan that was done around the beginning of the century is informing work that Point Blue Conservation Science is doing in their Working Lands Program. So using oaks to help bird populations on the working lands that they're involved in um, partnerships on. And then um, in our spring summer issue of oaks, we also talk about a partnership through our mother organization, the Wildlife Foundation, with the um, Climate Science Alliance, a group that we provide fiscal sponsorship to. And they're doing a lot of work with indigenous communities in Southern California, um, and a lot of work to restore fire and doing all these great job training programs with, with native youth um, to provide job opportunities that are part of a, a more climate resilient future. So that's kind of exciting um, work that they're doing. And um, just a couple acknowledgement slides to end. Um, up top here are folks we worked with at Department of Fish and Wildlife. Again, we couldn't have done our endangered species report without their help. Um, and um, our trusty editor, Janet Byron, who trudges through every newsletter to find those typos. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, Amy Lyons, who really helped with all the charts in the um, Endangered Species Report. And then the fellow who did the mapping and the carbon calculations is a member of our advisory board, Tom Gaiman, he's a forester. Um, and then um, the young woman who helped with that overlay of the purple is Nina Salvador Barrel. she has great GIS skills. And then our Oaks Underground Report really wouldn't have happened without Professor Michael Allen from UC Riverside. And um, he actually has an article in our upcoming newsletter. And then Virginia, thank you for the 
invitation. And then last but never least, our executive officer, Janet Cobb. She's been at this for years and years and um, her enthusiasm for Oaks and tenacity is what really has caused me to, um, to persevere. 